Are you one of those people that can't get enough freedom in your life? Why don't you go check out Otters Talking Politics? It's a show run by John and Michaela, and they talk about the American political spectrum from the standpoint of a libertarian. They also go over not only the political side, but also the legal side, some philosophy, while also diving into some logic. You can check them out, Otters Talking Politics, on Google Play, Stitcher, and iTunes. Now, enjoy the show. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Liberty at Large. My name is Daniel, and I will be your host on this wonderful evening. So, this week, I have somebody special. I'm going to be talking to Nicholas Wildstar. He is running for governor of California. He's also a rapper, and he's running for the Libertarian Party. And I actually had a really good talk with him, had a really good chat with him, and I think we should definitely do it again so if you would like to support mr wildstar you can check all the links down below you can support him by buying his music you can also donate to his campaign if you so see fit Uh, i actually had a really good talk with him and i'm really happy that i got the chance to sit down and have a conversation with him we talked all about pretty much california Um, and his campaign, some racism in the police force, and also a couple of different other things in our culture. So with that being said, my name is Daniel, and you're listening to Liberty at Large. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Liberty at Large. My name is Daniel, and I will be your host. As you heard in the intro, and tonight I have a very special guest, somebody who I've been looking forward to speaking to for quite a long time now, which is uh, Mr. Wildstar. He is running for a California governor. Uh, His first name is Nicholas. Nicholas Wildstar, if I'm not mistaken, correct? You got it. All right, cool, cool. Okay, so he is running for California governor for the Libertarian Party, and um, I've been kind of doing a series trying to get the Libertarians who are running for state governor in my state onto the show. Uh, A couple couple weeks ago, we talked with Zoltan Itzvan, and we talked to him for about a half an hour, and that was really, really fun, so if you want to go and listen to that show, you, you can go ahead and listen to it, but... Without further ado, I will let Mr. Wildstar introduce himself and kind of what his politics are, so take it away. Absolutely. Well, first, thank you very much for having me, Daniel, as well as the audience here at Liberty at Large, so I appreciate you inviting me to be on the show. Uh, my name, again, is Nicholas Wildstar, and I'm Libertarian running for governor of California. I ran for governor in 2014 as an independent candidate and was very involved in the anonymous and Occupy movement as a uh, activist and pretty much got introduced to the ideals of libertarianism by way of Dr. Ron Paul and his um, his campaign, his presidential campaign at that time. So I started to, to hearing uh, started hearing about minimizing government and you know, ending taxation and auditing the Federal Reserve and uh, just pretty much resonated with me as a person and a voter. And that's when I started to vote Libertarian and have, am now a member of the party and am hoping to influence the people of California to vote Libertarian as well. Well, we definitely need to get the Democrats out of here because they've proven that all that, all that they want to do here is just increase taxes and jerry brown you know when he did the um the gas tax just basically talked to us like he was force feeding us his vegetables and just saying hey you know we're just gonna have to suck it up and we're just gonna have to do it it's like no you're passing your bad spending on to us which is just ridiculous exactly. for so many reasons so um you gotta love those carrots oh god yeah i know so you talked a little bit about uh mr ron paul and he was very interesting because I read one of his books. Um, I, I, I can't remember the title right now, but he said something in there which basically re- resonated to me. And, and he said, if you believe that a, a, a individual has the right to live however they see fit without hindering them or as long as they're not inciting violence upon, uh, upon you or somebody else, then you're libertarian. And I think that has to do with a lot of, of you know, America, right? 
right now, and I don't think a lot of people know about the libertarian movement or what a libertarian actually means. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you was, what? Yeah. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you was, you know, how did you come to that mindset, and you know, what are some of the the influential people besides Mr. Ron? Ron Paul, which you, you know, already explained that you really look up to, um, either past or current in politics. Absolutely. Well, it sounds as if you probably read the book Liberty Defined written by Dr. Ron Paul. And, um, I read that book as well. And, uh, uh, what started to get me interested in it all together was money. You know, that seems to be one of the things that cripples the majority of the people in this country. Like I said, I was involved in the Occupy movement, and it was the 99% versus the 1%. Those small, few individuals that tend to be able to influence and dictate policy for the majority of the people in this country. So when I was introduced to the Federal Reserve and monetary policy and not knowing anything about where money came from or, you know, et cetera, which majority of this people, the people in this country don't tend to even um, inquire about. It opened my eyes to the true fraudulent nature of what's going on in our country and how we're really being robbed of our ability to be free and not experience oppression or poverty, no matter what our background or ethnicity or whatever the case may be. So um, I was very excited by the idea of actually auditing the Federal Reserve and am still to this day. I also became, um, uh, I guess, introduced to more ideas of libertarianism by way of Uh, Andrew Napolitano, he's, um, I believe he was a judge, but he was a personality on Fox as well, and had his own show, as well as Jesse Ventura, the former mayor of Minnesota, but um, the non-aggression principle of the Libertarian Party itself is the first thing that every member of the party actually takes an oath to uh, upon becoming a member, and that's to respect an individual and let them be free to do as they please and you have the right to do as you please freely and peacefully as well as as long as there isn't any violence involved and you're right that is something that we should be agreeing with and being introduced to nowadays in politics especially with the current uh, political climate causing controversy etc so um, it would be a more unifying factor to allow us to just live peacefully as we should right and i think there's a lot to you know to break down and kind of what you said like one of the things that i really fight for is transgender and gay rights and you know when i say transgender and gay rights i mean their ability to not be treated differently than any other human human being like i'm not for you know getting special treatment if you're trans or if you're gay but i am for them being treated as equal people People, I said it plenty of times on my show that my nephew is actually trans, and you know, just just looking at him and communicating with him, kind of, you know, like what his mindset is, and on things, he's he's female to male, and you know, he he doesn't he, he doesn't force it upon anybody. He's really smart. He's actually he's he's fifteen. He's really really smart about it. You know, like he doesn't consider somebody doing the misgender a you know act of violence or something like 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 that. You know, and that's one thing that I really um, respect about him at such a young age is that he's a very logically thinking person. And so I think there's a lot to be said, especially with the Democratic Party when they're trying to use government, especially with the C-16 laws in Canada, where they're trying to make it some sort of, you know, crime to misgender you. And, you know, that, you know, it's 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 one thing like what Jordan Peterson says. He says, you know, it's it's one thing if you ask me to and I do it because I'm willing to do it because I respect you and I respect you as a human being. But once you start involving the government that becomes a act of violence against me and so that's kind of where i feel the democratic party is moving but then i but then i feel that the republican party is moving towards kind of what their stance on like 
immigration is, which is just the Sessions and Trump kind of idea, which is just like, don't let anybody in. So I think when we start speaking in absolutes, when we start saying that, you know, like, you cannot do this, you cannot do do this, you should be be doing this. I think that's where the Libertarian Party kind of kind of comes in and says, like, what, like, what does it matter? Like, does it directly affect your life if somebody exactly. is gay or trans? Does, does that directly affect, does it cause you to have higher taxes? Like, there is no aggression against you. Just let them live their life as they see fit. So I think that's where libertarians... Exactly. And, and I think that that's where li libertarians fail. Um, I had a great talk with Kevin Shaw, and he, you know, really brought to my attention that people, especially the libertarian party... We're over here. We're squabbling about you know economics with socialists and communists and Democrats. That we're losing sight of the fact that if you believe that you have the freedom to live your life as you see fit, that we should be finding common ground with these people. And so that's where I think the libertarian movement has failed to a point is that we're much more worried about taxes than we are about personal liberty. And so that's like one of my Right. One of my critiques of the Libertarian Party, especially when it comes to the political part of it. Um, so one thing I did notice, too, when I was doing research, because I, I try to do at least about a week of research on the person that I'm talking to that I don't really sound ignorant. But I did notice that you are a rapper. And I, I find that really interesting because, yes, well, I mean, I, I find that really interesting because there's not a lot of people who are in politics who are a rapper and there's even a fewer amount of, of people who use their political experience to rap about you know like usually you hear about like gunshots and you hear about like gangs and get that booty and all that stuff like that but, but when i listen to your stuff i i got this sense of like freedom like you were very passionate about what you did and as somebody who's a metalhead like i hate rap i cannot stand pop pop culture i can't stand pop music i'm all about metal if there's pretty much if there's no screaming in it i just will not listen to it so i wanted to know kind of like <laughs> so I, I i wanted to know kind of like what what your journey has been like going through a rapper and kind of like having your two separate lives where like one life you're running for California governor, but the other life you're, you know, that you're a rapper. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, it's funny that at a point, the two uh, passing life seem to meet at the center. And that's what I saw myself becoming as a musician was someone that was more conscious minded, someone more independently minded and wanting to, awaken the people around me about the ills of our society. I really feel like as a rap artist, that's pretty much their jobs is to be that spokesman for the inner city and kind of be that voice for those people that tend to be unheard. Um, so as a MC, um, moving out to California to pursue a career in music, you know, I had stars in my eyes thinking, of course, this was going to happen overnight, but then saw the real world with the music industry itself. And it is a business, first and foremost. And a lot of people don't even know that. And when it comes down to contracts and royalties and um, residuals and points on contracts, uh, you know, uh, right. et cetera. So um, just learning all of this stuff as a artist kind of opened my eyes to more about what I should be speaking about. So um, once I started to write music that had that more of a tone, um, I, again, just pretty much saw myself evolving as a, as a person, as a human being, to where I did want to deal with those um, social injustices going on. And I did want to have an opportunity to speak with other people about them. It's just being able to resonate with them and uh, connect with them on that middle ground that you were speaking about. And because there are not too many people, uh, or I should say this, there are a lot of people that are more accepting to government's role and it having some bit of authoritative, um, dictatorial role in our lives. I resent that i definitely think we should we could live more peacefully without their intrusion and um 
not only with taxes, but even with just your paycheck. Right, and I think there's a First lot... And foremost, everybody is affected by that. Right, and I think there's a lot. Yeah, to, so I, to I, I think someone, there's. I think there's a lot to break down, kind of like with what you're saying, especially on like the social part part of it. Um, but go ahead and 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 continue there. I'm sorry. No, no problem. I was saying, you know, fighting for property rights. I want to be able to take care, uh, take away all of my paycheck and my earnings, just as much as I know some person making ten times more than what I'm making. Um, would want to do so um, my music itself just pretty much became an example of that transition and um, my last album that I just wrote and um, put out there for the public is called Evolve or Die it's on my SoundCloud page Uh, I'm pretty much speaking about a lot of the things that I've went on in my personal life um, with regards to courts and you know, racial injustices with the police, et cetera, um, and just provide that in a, in a format to where hopefully everyone will be able to relate, no matter what type of music that they may listen to or what background they may have or whatever race they may be. Um, so I really would like for everyone out there to have an opportunity to listen to it, even if they don't like rap music i appreciate you so much for being brave enough to actually do it (laughs) Um, (laughs) as well as being able to relate with it in some way you know because that's what matters the most we need to start listening to each other and see what each other has to say that way we can sit down at the table and come to a a agreement to where we can respect each other and and um live and coincide without a problem Right. And, you know, I, I did a whole I, I there was the State of the Union um, uh, uh, address on my show, which is about a month ago. I did pretty much a whole breakdown of the Grammys and all the virtue signaling that went on. And the bottom line is I pretty much explained it because I didn't even know why I hated pop pop culture too much <laughs> until until I actually like sat down and was like, why do I hate pop culture and rap music so much and i came to the basic conclusion of it is that what i don't like about it which you might be able to comment on it is like i I hate the Nicki minajs of uh, of of the world which is where you know we're as as men we you know we look at something and we find it attractive right so if we have this woman that is 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 saying in her private life that she wants to be respected as a woman she wants to be respected as a black woman but yet she's up there she's talking about how many guys that she slept with and then she's rapping about how big that her booty is and how men just lust over but we're supposed to treat her as a woman like we're not supposed to think about her that way even though all of her music is is like that and that was like my 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 like awakening of why is like that's why I hate pop culture in general and just rap music in general. But mm-hmm. which when I found out that you were a rapper, I was like, oh no, I I had to listen to one of his songs. <laughs> I have to, and I listened uh, to. And I thank you again for doing that. <laughs> I I think it was the second song off of Evolve, um, uh, Evolve or Die, and you know, it, and I actually enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. So like. You know, I, I, I tell people who are, you know, who like political stuff, like, go and check it out. I actually really enjoyed it, which I will, I'll, I'll put a link into the show notes on your YouTube channel and your sound, your SoundCloud and all that stuff, too. So, um, but speak. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. I like to, you know, support everyone as best I can. So. Yes, I definitely need much as possible right now and um having people hear that album as well as share it with someone else as you're doing is definitely going to be able to give me an opportunity to be heard by more people because that's what i would love to do as a musician as a rap artist and i didn't have the millions of dollars behind me that the record labels put into this these substanceless artists you know it's a they have an agenda 
with the music that they actually provide to the public, just as the people that control policy and lobbyists do in Washington and in our state legislature, uh, legislators. So um, it, the same people want to stay in control. And it's a dumbing down of society that's happening on so many levels. And with our music, it's definitely being done because it is a uh, form of art that we all tend to enjoy in some way, shape, or form or another. So as a rap artist, I'm hoping to be able to use that platform to connect with people and let them know, hey, this is an opportunity for us, we the people, to actually um, create that revolution that we need politically to get into office. So I would be one of the first rappers to actually get uh, elected into a, a, a public you know, servant position. And I would love to have a chance to do so. Cool, cool. So you did talk about some of the racial injustice with, you know, which, you know, you are a black man. Let's go ahead and, you know, put that out there into the world. So there's there, it, it, like there, there has been a lot of, I, I, I guess, not stereotyping, but like, you know, you, you look at a black man and the way that the left has classified it as is like 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 if you're not a democrat then you're against us like then you're against you know the black culture and i think you know um do you watch the dave rubin show no i don't i actually had never heard of him until you uh <laughs> you know suggested such so i watched a few videos and yeah pretty damn good stuff there yeah so I have to check it out more often so one of the videos that I would really check out is Candace Owens. So Candace Owens was, um, so she long, long story short, when, when Gamergate happened, which Gamergate was basically this chick claimed that a bunch of cyber bullies were bullying her. So Candace Owens started a, a, a Kickstarter to basically bring cyber bullying to the for forefront so this this company would tell you where the emails like what actually email like this was actually coming coming from so that you could you know send that to the police and say hey these people are bullying me which it sounds like a great idea so she gets a email from this chick who's claiming that that she was bullied just saying hey you're gonna ruin everything everything's gonna be bad you're gonna ruin it all and so a few days later, the, the New York Times calls her. And of course, the New York Times, you never take a phone call from them because they're going to skew it some, somehow. And so they talked to her. I'll keep that in mind. So they basically ran a story which said that Candace Owens was telling this chick that, that her experience did not mean nothing. And they just like ostracized her even though she's been like a longtime democrat she's like they were saying that she was complicit in bullying even though she was trying to you know you know prevent bullying and the whole entire left just like destroyed her and so that was the moment that she found out where she she where she was just like this is like an all an all in or a all out thing and now she's a con conservative and she's been called like racial slurs by by the left and it's just it, it drives me up a wall because we have these people that are saying that we're the you know quote tolerant people but i can tell you the most racist things that i have ever heard from somebody are from leftists and when i say leftists i mean like you know antifa people when i say liberals i mean people who actually sit sit down and have a call conversation with you so when you have like you know leftists like that that are crying about we need to we need government to enforce the laws but then they're crying about you know police bru brutality like it's kind of like a like oxymoron there right so like like so the question i have for you is like how how has you being a black man come into effect with you being a libertarian also like how is the how has how have I guess, like, African-Americans treated you, even though you do have some conservative ideals? 
Well, it's been a struggle on all fronts, not only with the uh, black community, but as well as with white the white community, um, with the left and the right. I've, um, again, seeking to represent all people of the state. So uh, I have been to, um, quote unquote, I guess, liberal left-leaning um, minded events. I don't really like the term liberal that tend to have been politicized, but as well as the word conservative with, you know, the um, right leaning, I guess, minded people. But um, I have went out to protests where there has been a, you know, a killing amongst the community by a police officer and um, wanted to speak with the people there about how we could make those changes through policy and excite them about my campaign and it fell upon deaf ears because the the communities where uh, they represent more people of color don't tend to have much faith in the political system in the justice system in law enforcement so to come in on the scene and especially as a black person and say hey i can fix this it's a hard sell now on the other side I come on the scene and say, hey, I can fix this because I have experienced those things myself um, to a white audience. And um, as much as they may feel as if I could overcome those issues by being put up on, uh, you know, and given a limelight in the political scene, but um, they want me to look a certain way because I have, you know, uh, shoulder length dreadlocks and um, you know, uh, I have a goatee on my face. I look unkept and they want somebody to look like Barack Obama. They want somebody that looks like Larry Elder in order to, uh, uh, accept a black person and, um, I guess be a representative that they want them to be. So I'm having to fit many different molds here instead of just being able to be accepted for just being myself. Because not all of us look the same. Not all of us think the same. Even with Black Lives Matter, I went to a few of their um, committee meetings where uh, they were explaining to the groups there about, you know, their um, cause or and trying to recruit others to get involved. And um, I went there, my wife and I, first time, we asked a few family members, and I just wanted to see what it was all about. And I live in Orange County, which is majority white, and um, but there were a few, uh, I guess, it was a very diverse audience, majority white again. But they were pretty much promoting about how if you say all lives matter is pretty much a dirty word. And at the end of it all, they had a bit of a Q&A where I stood up and I asked a question, which was, do you, which was just, do you think the name Black Lives Matter could be alienating when you're attempting to get everybody behind this cause? But they don't know the first thing about me. They don't know that I've had my own experiences with police abuses. I've recorded them. I have them available on YouTube right now. So <laughs> um, they don't know about the racial injustices I've dealt with in my own life. But all of a sudden, after I ask this question, I start getting attacked by them, saying, um, am I an, um, uh, a police agent or, you know, a provocateur? And they... They pretty much <laughs> hushed me up and then escorted me out. One of the girls, you know, there, one of the uh, coordinators asked me, could she speak to me outside? You know, she called me the N-word, the you know. <laughs> uh, and this is a black girl. And she's speaking to me that way. And she's telling me, you know, I bet you're one of those black girls that have a white woman, you know, and you don't know what's going on. I said, actually, my wife is in there and she's black, too. And she dealt with this the same situations as I have. So for you to come off in such a discriminatory manner tells me that your cause has um, has ulterior motives, you know? And I being a black man, especially being one seeking office, I do know those laws that are periling the black community about 
the police bill of rights that is that extra layer of protection that lets bad cops get off the hook. I would love to have right. a chance to repeal that. I would love to have a chance to get rid of the oppressive drug laws that have affected the majority of people of color. Um, but again, leveling, leveling with them to let them know the change can be done in a way to where the, um, it needs to be done through policy is a hard sell. And it's, it's a bit frustrating at times when I am in need of their support, everyone's support, and them still having to kind of um, lean with their ideals of, uh, I guess, conformatism or statism, whatever the case may be. Right, right. And I think there's, there's you know, a lot to say for, you know, it's, 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 it's the all or nothing mindset that these people have. And like, I have a lot of grievances with the Black Lives Matter movement. And, you know, one of them is that, you know, they, again, like, just exactly what, what you said is that if you really truly believe that that black lives matter then maybe we should have all of you know the opinions in the the black community out there but really it's just a militant group to force identity politics on onto people and it, it drives me up a freaking wall it, just, right. it drives me nuts especially living right next to oakland and berkeley i mean you know if you want people to the the civil rights acts of nineteen sixty six and Martin Luther King only worked because people saw these police officers beating the crap out of these people who were just simply walking because they had sympathy, right? But when you right. but when you start blocking off highways and you start rioting, you start destroying businesses that that have created the the immunity there people lose all interest they lose all sympathy for you because then you're just turning into a bunch of rioters and i think that that that's i think the black lives matter movement was something that was good when it started but now it's just turned into this kind of like militant group forcing identity politics onto people and it just it drives me up a freaking wall so yeah. <laughs> so well i would i would like to say i don't have any problem with exercising civil disobedience i definitely think it's necessary right now however being one that has been involved in many demonstrations like i said the occupy and anonymous protests and everything in between um monsanto for gmos and police shootings etc um it's a waste of time and that's the one thing as a protester, as an activist, you kind of walk away feeling empty with after the event is over. It's like, okay, well, what do we do now? What happens now? Right. We got it all out of our system, but nothing is going to change that. And when I got to that point to where I was fed up with it, that's where I started to tell my you know, fellow activists that, hey, we need to make this shift because it's – it's going to be those types of changes that are going to um, be everlasting and are going to be those um, those type of pivotal moments to where we won't have to worry about ever have to dealing with this ever again. So it's sad to kind of hear or um, see it fall on deaf ears when I speak about these things. And, um, yeah, with the Black Lives Matter, even with the uh, protests that I've been to, I live in uh, near Anaheim and Santa Ana, which has a lot of Hispanic uh, members of the community as well who have been uh, victim and fell victim of police brutalities and killings. And, you know, I've went to their protests as well, and they are shouting Brown Lives Matter, you know? So right. it's it's all alienating when we're trying to unite for the same cause, you know? And, um, yeah, it's just sad because you're right. It is sort of um, a turnoff when you see all of this happening and you want to get people's sympathy to get involved or be able to um, motivate you to make that change, but it's just not there. So, well, I think there's a lot to be said. I mean, I am, you know, a white person. So I, I, I think there's a lot to be said to where, like, you know, going back to the systemic racism kind of with the police force. Like, you know, I don't necessarily believe there's a systemic 
a systemic racism inside of the federal government. But I do believe that there is a lot of stereotype typing when it comes to how the police enforce laws in the black community. And, and a lot of it has to go back to like the 1960s and 70s where they got the civil rights and the police were just like, well, you guys are on your own, you know, and, and that that kind of really it, it was, you know, it, it's one thing to learn about it when. You know, you, you go through, you know, high school, but when you go through a college class and the, in the, in, you know, the college teacher has a lot more freedom with what they can do. I'm um, just learning about like what people had to go through just to get the right to vote, just to get the right to work, you know, and, and the stuff that Martin Luther King had to go through. It just, it, it blows my, my mind that it was okay to treat somebody of a different color like that. So like one of the questions that I had for you too was, you know, do you believe that there's a systemic racism problem in the United States? And when I mean systemic racism problem, as in like there are people who are actively, the majority of Americans are actively trying to keep people of color, you know, from getting jobs or from moving up in, in the world. <laughs> not the majority but there is a minority of them and they are white let's just be honest oh yeah they are, are. Uh, honest you, they are anglo anglo saxon protestant americans you know which tend to be caucasian so um those are the few that are creating the systematic racist policies that are creating that um, that environment where the people of color are suffering. You just look at with what you were talking about with police. They're, the way that they're trained is to go out looking for specific individuals, okay? Um, racial profiling is something that they're taught when they go to get their training and something that, again, is unnecessary and ends up creating more victims opposed to finding actual criminals and preventing crimes from happening. So uh, that is a systemic policy. And I guess, um, I don't even know what to say about it, but that, that is something to where it's an idea that hasn't been changed at all. And that for some reason it's being embraced and people just kind of shrug off. We know right. it, We know that's the way things are. But we aren't really trying to um, change the way the police are doing any of their conducting any of their business in, in their cities. Right. And, you know, I, I'm not the libertarian, which is that all taxes are theft. I think there are taxes which we need to have. Um, and I think taxes for a police force is something that we should have. Otherwise, we turn into, you know, anarchy. And, you know, it, 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 I I. I think there's a lot to say that well, you know. What are the police force doing? What are they policing? Well, I I, I when think. You talk about. Well, I mean, I I think what's good for that is that you know there are some good cops out there who really want to do good work as far as getting criminals off of the street. Exactly. Um, you know, as far as keeping drugs out of. Right. You know, keeping drugs out of you know schools, keeping drugs out of kids' hands. I think that's important. But when you start kind of coming into the mindset of like all black people or all, you know, Hispanic people are need to be a target, I, I think that's where the police force fails. And the, I think the question is more of a philosophical question than a legislative question, which is how do we exactly. get out of that mindset? And I think the hard part well, is training people first. to do that. Yeah. And I, I think it starts first with those policy changers. If they're police officers, they're enforcing policies, bad policies. And what I was saying about the drug laws, possession of marijuana, is that really an offensive crime? No, it's being not. harmed by that. Um, so decriminalization is really the necessary step that we need to be making as a society to where people who aren't doing anything to harm anyone aren't ending up being victims themselves of bad policy and um these altercations with police because they are of a different race it and there is that kind of a 
power complex, you know, um, with the authority, then when they come into a person's home, um, you know, like you said, we're men, so we're going to want to stand up and, you know, defend ourselves, especially when we feel like we've done nothing wrong. And if someone else is being threatened by someone else, then we're going to want to protect them. But yet you refuse the right to do so simply because you're told to comply um, right. for no reason at all, other than the fact that that person is wearing a costume with a badge and is delegated a certain role by you, the, the people. You put them in control. So what you're talking about, you know, cops keeping drugs away from kids. No, they don't. The real world, come on, man. The world we live in, you know this. Kids can get drugs easily anywhere that they can. Oh, totally. What we need to do is allow parents to do more of policing of their own children to inform them about the dangers of drugs and addiction, whether it be um, cocaine or meth or high fructose corn syrup you know, beverages, <laughs> you right. have people that are addicted to donuts and foods. Uh, it, it's, it doesn't matter. So we need to become more responsible as individuals. And of course, adults need to start being grownups again, instead of thinking that they need to have a big brother over them to breathe down their shoulder and tell them what they need to be doing all of the time. Yeah, I mean, I've always said that, you know, government is not mommy and daddy. So government is not there to point you into the right direction. Right. You know, the people who created this this great country basically said that, you know, the individual is in charge of themselves. And I think that we've we've lost that, especially with like the Medicare system, with Social Security and, you know, Medicaid and all that stuff, too. And yeah, I mean, yes. like, like the whole police force thing is just, it's kind of a touchy subject because, you know, like I, I know, I, like when you look at the, at the FBI numbers and you look at all those arrest stats and you go, okay, look, violent crime is committed more by black Americans than, than it is by white Americans. Like that's not a racist stat. That's just, you know, me, you know, regurgitating the stats that are, you know, given to me. So I think the real question is how do well, what's we? What's a violent crime? Yeah. yeah. So you know, like you see, you I, see what I'm saying? Yeah. Ex yeah. Why exactly. Are stealing? Exactly. <laughs> you know exactly, and and that's and 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 it's one of those things too, like how I explained it to somebody who told me that you know we shouldn't re 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 rehabilitate people. I said, okay, well, what if you get out of prison and you've been in prison for ten years, right? Nobody's going to give you a job because you have, you know, a felony on you, right? So when you have a daughter and your daughter is crying that she's hungry, what do you do? You go back to doing whatever you did before because you were good at it. You just got caught. And that's what I think that our system fails is that we don't have a incentive for employers to hire pe people who have been felons so then they go back to sleeping drugs. They go back to to pro os 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 institution, right. which is just a wrong for so many reasons. You shouldn't be able to arrest somebody for selling their body. Just so stupid. But um, so moving on from that, because there's there's a couple of other things that I want to talk I'll, I'll talk about with you. So um, I'm sure, like you, you were watching right. the TV and you saw the Parkland shooting, and I'm sure your heart just 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 broke like everyone else did um you know i've never shot a weapon i don't own a weapon um my wife takes depression meds so she's not comfortable with having you know a gun in the house which i totally you know uh, uh respect and but my question for you is that there's been a lot of talk about the teachers who have their ccw being able or who and and who are veterans and who are tactically trained being able to carry a weapon in a classroom like i want to know kind of like what like what your thoughts were on that and what and what are your thoughts on like armed guards and metal metal d detectors in the schools in california well i think the metal detectors and armed guards is definitely an image that we shouldn't be presenting to our children 
if anything, it, it gets them in the mindset, in the prison state mindset, to where they start looking at um, those types of facilities as institutions. We don't want them to feel that way. We want our kids to be comfortable in class. And I would think that um, a child and, and their parent would be more protected if the teachers or the faculty and staff members were able and given the ability to arm themselves. I mean, um, this really just needs to be a matter left to people of the community, the school districts and their own, um, you know, uh, legislature. So for government to get involved and to try to dictate someone being able to protect themselves is definitely unconstitutional. I support constitutional carry. I think anybody should be able to uh, protect themselves by any means. Um, you have guns right now. It's just a matter of technology to where, who knows, in a decade or 20 years or so, we could have handheld lasers. Right now, you can print a 3D gun. So right. do we need extra restrictions to say what a person what is uh deemed a weapon or not it just says you have the right to bear arms um so at that time that may have been muskets but with the evolution of technology that evolved to something else but so did telephones you know <laughs> so we can't look at the technology and blame the technology for what's at fault and it's not a matter of need if I want to be able to buy a gun, I should be at liberty to do so. It's a piece of property, and I'm using my hard-earned money to do so. So I shouldn't have to register it, whether it be what register my property, whether it be a gun, a car, um, or anything else that is mine. Um, so it's sad that these fundamental principles of who we are as human beings are being compromised by our social um, vulnerabilities as people to think that we should again give the power of what we all should do to a small few and we are not a democracy we are a constitutional republic and the constitution does not give you the right to bear arms. It says government needs to protect your right to bear arms. If it wasn't there anymore, that doesn't mean you don't have the right to protect yourself anymore. Right. Does it? Because you have the natural right to do so. It's just, again, a, a legal document that specifically recognizes that as being one of your inherent rights and definitely should be protected by our legislators, but unfortunately, due to lobbyists on the left and right, we have this battle going on in the middle. And the only thing that can stop that is a respect of the Constitution by our sworn representatives, and which is why I'm running for office myself. We got to yeah. get things back on track. Yeah, and I think this is why, like, when I debate pe people who have you know who who don't like guns i asked them the first question that, that that i asked them is do you believe that it is my right to protect myself and my property by any means necessary and if they say no then i'm just like then there's no point in talking to you there's absolutely no point in having a, a you know because if you believe that natural rights are given to you by government it ceases to become a natural right Right. It ceases. It, it, it starts to become the government is allowing you to protect yourself. And it's a natural right that if somebody comes into your house to try to kill you, you have the right to kill them. Um, so and, and that's why that's why I think guns are you know important. The way that I explain it to people who don't get it, I say, you know, I'm not in fear of government tyranny right now. But what if we decide to give up all all of our guns? And then in a hundred years from now, our great grandkids are, are going to look at us and see why the hell did you give up your guns? Because now we have to deal with next Hitler. People don't realize that Hitler started his rise to power right. from, from, from the time he started in politics. He was actually jailed. He was, he was, you know, prisoned for, for pro protesting. And then he got, he got out 
and then he begged to come back into political market. And it took him about 15 to 20 years to get from the Hitler as a kid to Hitler, the Nazis. And during that time, Germany confiscated the guns after World War I. And so now the people did not have, you know, the chance to, to protect themselves. So that's why I believe the Second Amendment is so important, that even though I'm not going to own a gun, I believe it is everyone's right to own a weapon to protect themselves and their liberties. And once you start deeming that those liberties are government-given is where we have completely disagreement on it. So, um, absolutely, yeah, exactly. Be an infringement of it whatsoever. Yeah, you know exactly. So, a few more questions for you. We we got about ten ten more minutes. So, um, the right. gas tax hike. Um, that was one thing kind of through California for a loop. There were some people that were you know okay with doing it. Some people weren't. You know, I wanted to get kind of your idea on the gas tax hike and also kind of like what are some of the other taxes that you would try to um, repeal if you were elected as governor? Absolutely. Well, the gas tax is atrocious. I mean, here we are in the state of California paying some of the largest taxes for gas in the entire country. I mean, nearly a dollar of our purchases of gasoline per gallon is going to taxes. It's actually number five in the entire world. um, We have the fifth highest tax on gas in in the entire world. (laughs) Right. Wow, that's even more absurd. (laughs) And um, it's just sad to think that this money is actually being collected supposedly to and improve our infrastructure here in the state when we have a failed California high-speed rail that pretty much is going to end up being a billion plus trillion dollars if we don't stop the Democrats in their tracks. They're the ones collecting this money to supposedly fix our roads, yet if you d- drive down Moore Park or Mulholland or any other um, street in Los Angeles or Compton or Oakland, <laughs> um you know, the roads are terrible. So the roads aren't being fixed at all. We need to leave it to those cities, those mun- municipalities, and leave the money locally where it can be spent to actually improve the people's neighborhood. So um, we definitely need to stop the tax and spend trend in here in the state, which is why as governor I'm letting people know that I will – bring a hard line to that taxation without representation, starting first with the repeal of that new gas tax, as well as eliminating the state's income tax. Um, I think the people of this state need a reprieve since, um, you know, the minimum is 13% of their income. So I definitely believe they could all, we could all benefit from that. And um, with homeowners, they need a bit of a reprieve as well. You know, we have um, mortgages toppling, topping um, half a million dollars, a million dollars for just a two-bedroom home. So re- reducing the state uh, property tax to 0% is another goal of mine, as well as leveling the state's sales tax at 7% where that goes up and down very, depending on where you are as well. could be up to 30% depending on what you're buying. So um, these are some of the taxes I plan on cutting and would, again, just like to have an opportunity to do so. But first, I need the people of California to get active and get involved in my campaign. Yeah, I mean, I, I recently talked to a socialist on, on his show, and... I don't like using the word destroyed, like when you try to talk to somebody about like, you know, debating, but I'm pretty sure that I destroyed (laughs) that I like destroyed his, his his logic. And the basis of my argument was that, which it took me like 15 minutes to explain this to him. But basically I said, you know, if I walk into your house and I steal a hundred thousand dollars and I give it to things that you support, were you still robbed? And he goes, well, yes, I'm still at $100,000. And I said, then why are you okay with, with the government doing it? Why why are you turning a blind exactly. eye to to the government doing it? 
Just because you take the money that I have and you give it to things that I support does not mean that I, that I still was not robbed. And so I, I think that a lot of people right. like just don't either get that concept or just don't care about it. And this is where I take and this well and this is where I take the Ben Ben Sha, Shapiro stance, which is where I don't care about your feelings. I care about I care about what you can prove. And there is no way in shape or form that you can prove to me that by you taking my money and giving it to the government or the, or the federal government or the state government can somehow take care of me better than I can take 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 care of of myself. Like a perfect example, we're supposed to give up our guns to the government to the same sheriff's department which stood outside and watched 17 kids get slaughtered. And we're supposed to give up our guns to that to that same government and you know just just hope that we get a good cop that comes to our house. You know, I do not think so. So, right. um, my last couple of, it's, go ahead. Well, I want to add on that. It's just a conversion of our natural right to protect ourselves to a privilege. I mean, it's okay for you to have a gun. If you pay enough money to the government to get permission to have it, you know, they have to issue the license, the background check that you're paying for, you're paying for the permit. Um, and, of course, government is getting all of that money. And um, you can have armed guards, you can pay for that. They are given permission and special authority to protect themselves or someone else. But you are robbed and that ability to do so, that liberty. So it is sad that um, a lot of people condone some level of authoritarianism, and I think it is just a matter of conditioning of Americans altogether, no matter what your race may be. We've all been conditioned to this uh, acceptance of a level of democratic control. Um, so we need to shake that off and embrace a more liberal minded uh, idea to where we are free to be ourselves, protect ourselves and express ourselves as long as we aren't harming anyone else and um, should be afforded the opportunity to um, express any inherent right, no matter what it may be. Right. Right. And, and you know, it's, it, it just, it blows my mind that people are okay with losing those those liberties in the idea that they believed that the government was going to keep them safe and you know like let's not forget that people rebelled over the whiskey tax for three percent and we're sitting here and we're just you know oh oh well living in california it's just you know the 13 percent income tax it is what it is it's like no right. it's not it is what it is this idea exactly. that 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 california is striving for money. We had a six billion dollar surplus this year, so this idea that California needs more money is just dumb. It's just it's like the logic is just not there. So, my last right, my, yeah, we have one of the largest poverty rates in the nation. Um, go out to Oakland or Berkeley or you know even L L A County. There there's homeless people that are just everywhere and it's just it's just awful um right. but my last couple of questions for you was so the first one was what are your feelings on california sanctuary cities after kate St Heinley's death and then furthermore what are your feelings on the california um attorney general uh xavier Bacara? him you know imposing basically saying that businesses have to disobey federal law and follow California law? Well, I believe that Mr. Bakari is just upholding his constitutional oath, which is the Tenth Amendment. What rights and laws are that are delegated to the state? Um, the federal government has no right or authority to regulate or dictate that. So it, since it is to where here in California, any person is welcome to come here to look for an opportunity to flourish. Uh, it is an opportunity for the market itself to grow. And the people here are great contributors to the society. It's sad that uh, 
one incident got sensationalized to the point to where we feel as if there needs to be some changes with immigration in our state when really it just needs to be a a matter of change when it comes to police force and their investigations of criminals and their backgrounds and um, really being able to find a threat and um, notice one before it happens. So uh, that needs to be improved more than anything. And the immigration process is expensive. It prevents a lot of people that would love to come here to the state and be able to become contributing members of our society from coming here. And we have the false sense that these people are coming from Mexico for some reason, but the majority of immigrants in the state of California um, are coming from China. They're coming from India. So they're not... uh, within this demographic that we think is for some reason going to prevent Mexicans from coming here by way of a wall. Uh, The people coming here, the immigrants from other countries are coming here on planes. So uh, it's a false sense of security to think that by building a wall or by letting the federal government come in and scapegoat innocent people that have done nothing you know, out of our uh, out of our state and out of our country is acceptable. I mean, um, the federal government itself, according to the Constitution, does not have the legal authority to even be dictating uh, dictating immigration, only naturalization. So, um, again, if we hear the people of California and are, are seeing a benefit to those undocumented citizens or undocumented people being here, we should allow them the opportunity to become citizens and have a better pathway to do so. I personally think the process should be free to do so. It would benefit that person themselves as well as the state. It would be more so an incentive for them to want to become Americans. Right. Um, so these are policy changes that, again, should, are bad policy that needs to be changed to make the uh, climate of the conditions that we're living in more susceptible and peaceful for everyone that's living here. Well, I mean, I I never got the conservative mindset of, you know, just send them all back, you know, like what Sessions and Trump are doing. I never really got, got that. I, I, I've always taken the stance of we should ask the you know, three simple questions. Are you, are you a criminal? Are you able to adopt American values? And are you a benefit to America? And if, if, if all three, three of those, if you pass all those questions, there's no reason why you can't stay here. And I've, 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 exactly. I've stood by that for a very long time. And I, I just, I never got the, you know, let's make America white again. I, I never got, got that. And even to further the, 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 the point, And I think there's, you know, there, there's a lot of feelings that, that are on both sides. And I have a best friend, his name is Tony, which I'm going to, I'm going to have him on, uh, in a couple of weeks, but he's a constitutional conservative and he's always telling me, that conservatives never use feelings to 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 dictate their fat that that's what liberals does and i laugh at him and i go okay well you guys glorified the kate steinley death and said that you guys don't care enough you said that the liberal party doesn't care enough to to protect lives meanwhile in the parkland shooting now if you disagree with them on guns you don't care you're 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 complicit in murder you know, and so there, there's, there's those two things right. that are going on, on both sides. See, Tony, double standard. I told you so. Hashtag I told you so. And <laughs> he, he always hates it when I talk crap about him because he's like, I'm not there to defend myself. Well, next week you're gonna have a, you're gonna have a platform, buddy. You can, you know, embarrass me all you want. <laughs> but, but anyways, so I wanted to say thank you for your time. Um, it's been about an hour, so I want to respect your time. Um, thank you so much for coming on. I wish you the best of luck on your cam campaign trail. Um, go ahead and plug some stuff and where people can can find you and where we can support your campaign. Oh 
yes, indeed. I am needed that support. So please, like I said, um, do what you can to contribute. Uh, the Liberty Movement starts first and foremost with you. So please donate whenever you can. If you could visit my crowd pack, I'm doing crowdfunding through crowd pack. Um, so if you could visit my crowd pack, Wildstar, enter it in. You'll find me, Nicholas Wildstar, um, Libertarian candidate for governor. If you'd like to visit my website, that is wildstar2018.com. Please visit the website to find out more about my campaign. And there's donate buttons everywhere. So if you feel inspired to do so by my platform or my inspirations for running for office and wanting to make these vital changes to bring back liberty to the state of California, please definitely get involved. And um, one great way that you can also get involved if you're unable to contribute financially is heard. Um, since I am running a grassroots campaign and don't have the tens of millions of dollars that the Republicans and Democrats have to wastefully spend on their campaigns, um, just you sharing um, word of mouth and sharing information with your friends and family and everyone in your circle about me definitely helps. Social media is a great and powerful tool, and it is free. So utilize it and help me spread the word. <laughs> and um, just find out more about me. Listen to my music. Share that around. That would help me also if you're a music fan or even if you listen to it and say, hey, I don't like rap, <laughs> like you said. Right. Uh, but I do like this political message here that's trying to be used to awaken these people so um just help me share the message of course cool cool all right guys well you heard it here thank you so much for your time and i wish you the best of luck all right everyone peace out oh, thank you peace